He is known as the greatest boxer of all time. A controversial and magical figure, known and loved throughout the world. As soon as he stepped inside a boxing ring, it seemed to be home to him, and that's where he really flourished. Muhammad Ali brought unprecedented speed and grace to the sport of boxing. His trash talking forever changed what the public expected a champion to be. Oh, Henry Cooper's nothing but a tramp. He's a bum. I'm the world's greatest. He must fall in five rounds, but if you talk about me, I'll cut his three. His accomplishments in the ring are the stuff of legends, as he was involved in some of the greatest fights the world has ever seen. Fraser's corner man pulls him out, and uh, Ali <laughs> wins once again uh, one of the greatest bouts that there can have been inside the, the, the boxing ring. His success as a boxer is widely respected, and his techniques copied by many. But Ali's greatest triumph lies in his legacy as a champion leader, humanitarian, and artist. Ali is a tireless worker for what's right. You can, you know, you can case it in humanitarian, you can, you can use the word humanitarian, you can do what you like. He just likes to do the right thing. His work both inside and outside of the ring truly makes Muhammad Ali a legend. Ali, at his peak, was the greatest sportsman, greatest fighter in history. This is the incredible story of the greatest sporting icon of all time. Muhammad Ali's life and career have played out as much on the front pages of newspapers as on the inside sports pages. His tale of controversy and success is most definitely a unique one. Where did it all begin for the sporting legend? Cassius Marcellus Clay, big uh, idol of mine and obviously many, many others, um, he was born into a Catholic family, um, raised in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Well, unlike many boxers, I suppose Ali wasn't somebody who came from the wrong side of the tracks. He had a very supportive middle-class family. Religion was very central to his upbringing. His mother, Odessa, brought he and his brother up, Rudy, as a Baptist. He was born in Louisville. He was, he was christened Cassius Marcellus Clay. What people I don't think fully understand is it was a segregated city. It wasn't a city with a bit of racial tension. It was a black city and a white city, and they didn't mix. There were three areas where black people lived. And of those three areas, there was a mixed three areas, and Ali lived in the sort of middle for the better half of it. He belonged to a Baptist church, and more than he belonged to a Baptist church, he was dragged along to that church. He used to sing in the choir in that church, and he was part of that church. One of the stories that often uh, stood out to me there was the, the story that he, he used to force his brother to throw stones at him to improve his reflexes and his head movement. It showed, one, the confidence that he had in his own ability, uh, and also that he, he was fast because, uh, as far as I'm aware, he was never actually hit with a stone. It was clear that from a very young age he almost had boxing in his mind because he used to get his brother Rudy to try and throw rocks at him in the backyard and try to hit him and his brother thought he was crazy but he said he never managed to strike Ali once with a rock because he was so light at his feet. So clearly, even as a developing youngster, he, he had boxing on his mind. With boxing clearly in his blood, Ali's interest grew even more when he was just 12 years of age. As through a stroke of good luck, he met boxing coach Joe Martin. Well, it wasn't until the age of 12 that Ali really got the boxing bug. Uh, he was uh, apparently really angry because somebody had stolen his bike and he wanted to beat up the guy who had done it. A local policeman called Joe Martin got hold of him and said, look, if you're going to fight somebody, you've got to learn to box. So Martin took him to a local gym and very quickly, Ali showed he was very adept as a boxer. Joe Martin uh, describes uh, Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali as the hardest working kid he ever had, and uh, well, his hard work paid remarkable dividends. Ultimately, Ali was a very, very hard worker, and Joe Martin, the man who in many ways discovered him, said that he'd never seen a harder working kid in the gym, and so clearly Ali's roots as a boxer went very deep. He wanted to 
apparently beat up the kids that stole his bike. It seems crazy now. Something like that would have made him go into a gym and look to learn to fight. And he parked his bike, which was his pride and joy, and it was stolen. And someone says to him, hey, listen, you know, why don't you go down in a basement there, a guy down there called Joe Martin, he's a policeman and he runs a boxing program, go and tell him. Ollie goes down the stairs, he's screaming, Joe Martin can't even understand what he's saying, but he takes a report and then as Ollie's leaving, he can see all this anger in this young kid. And so Joe Martin says to him, hey, by the way, take this form, fill it out. If you fancy coming to the boxing, and Ollie went, bingo, I'll have a little bit of that. He told his parents in, they were quite relieved because they didn't want him running around the street. Quite correctly, the parents said, yeah, no problem, but hey, you're gonna get there, I've got a bike. So don't, no problem, I'll borrow someone else's bike. With a clear desire to succeed in the ring, Ali then went on to begin his amateur career. I suppose people must have began to take notice of Ali as an amateur. I mean, I think he had 108 fights as an amateur, uh, only losing a, a single bout. Well, very soon, Ali was the real name on the American amateur circuit, and, and that was a very hard school. Only decent boxers managed to flourish. He had 108 fights and only lost one of them, which was a remarkable record. Well, he started to fight, first of all, for, for Joe Martin at his gym. Then he switched across town or across whatever passes for town in Louisville to a guy called Fred Stoner's gym. This was a slightly better gym. Stoner had better fighters. Stoner had guys that went off to not just local, localised Golden Gloves tournaments, but to regional and to national tournaments. So Ali just ploughed himself into that, was re receiving small fees, but the, fee the, fees, the fees are nothing to do with it. All he was talking about from the age of 13, 14, 15, was that he would win the national Golden Gloves. He would win the Olympic title and he would win the world heavyweight title. And people forget that Ali didn't reinvent himself later in life and suddenly become this guy that made these bold claims and wrote things in gloves and wrote poetry. He was rattling on like this when he was 14 and 15. The difference is nobody was listening at 14 and 15. 10 years later, the entire world's media was listening, but it was no difference. Well, he won six Kentucky Gold Gloves, which really gives you an indication of how good he was as an amateur boxer, because American amateur boxing at that time was a very, very hard school. But uh, Ali quickly adapted to the sport and, and made a real impression. And he got $4 a fight, which was uh, nothing compared to what he got when he was a professional in his later career. Having experienced huge success in his early amateur career, Ali earned the right to represent his country at the 1960 Olympic Games in Rome. This was when the world started to take note of Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali in later life seemed scared of, of absolutely nothing. When he was a youngster, he had a real fear of flying. So he almost didn't make it to the 1960 Olympics because it was a long flight. And throughout the whole flight, he actually took his own parachute on board and he spent the whole flight on his knees praying in the aisles. But eventually he got there and of course he ended up walking away with a gold medal. The European media, who hadn't really heard of this guy, Cassius Clay, suddenly became aware of this very, very stylish boxer. Cassius Clay was, was selected for the, uh, the Rome Olympics. Apparently they had a real battle to get him on the, the plane in the first place because uh, he had a, a fear of flying. I mean, the guy fought all the top heavyweights of his era uh, and showed no fear at all. But apparently he was, uh, he was praying in the aisle of the plane. He arrives in Rome where uh, obviously he goes and wins a gold medal. Well, Ali was only 18, but he was far from a, a callow youth in the, the Olympic Games. The, the journalists who were there covering it, many of whom had never heard of Cassius Clay, were quick to praise him for his supreme confidence. And six years after somebody stole his bike in Kentucky, he was the Olympic champion. He just ploughed his way through with a display and a show of boxing that shocked people. The coaches from Poland and Russia, they'd never seen that before. And suddenly there was an 18 year old kid doing it to their boxers, European champions, Olympic champions, veterans of the amateur circuit, making them look like they were statues. That was quality. After his Olympic success, Ali returned back to the USA as a national hero. But to some people, he was just another black man who they wanted nothing to do with. Well, after the Olympics, Ali returned to America as a real hero. The American Olympic Association had a huge parade to honor all their gold medalists, and Ali was central to that. He won the gold medal in the, the Rome Olympics, and uh, 
returns home to the US, his home country, he's represented the whole country and brought home a gold medal. He found it very difficult to, to understand and to uh, relate to the, the political and the, 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 the social environment that was going on in America. Vast sections of society uh, just saw him as a, a, as a black guy and wanted nothing to do with him. But once the Olympics had moved on and memories faded, in, in the eyes of many people he became just another black person on the streets. And of course, at that time in America, segregation was a real issue. And Ali and a friend went into what was then a whites only restaurant in Kentucky, his home city, and he was refused service. And that made Ali really angry. And it was claimed at the time he actually took his gold medal and threw it into the Ohio River because he, he believed it was worth nothing because even though he had been praised greatly for it by the American sporting public, once he came home, of course, it was worthless. He arrived home to Louisville and he was given a good reception. He chose to go with a friend of his to a biker's bar. The, the waitress serving him said, look, you know, it's going to be a problem. You should best leave. He sat down, nodded to one of the bikers who he'd seen at some of his fights, overcomes the boss man, now you've got this guy in your mind's eye. He's a fat white guy covered in bacon grease and he stands in front of Ali and says to Ali, we don't serve niggers in here. Now Ali said, that's good because I don't eat them. After his achievements at the 1960 Olympics, Ali went on to sign his first professional contract with the Louisville Sporting Group. So he wins the gold medal in the Olympics and he signs a contract with a, uh, a consortium uh, from Louisville called the Louisville Sporting Group and uh, they, they set out to finance his, uh, his career. Well after Ali returned from Rome with the Olympic gold medal he was always going to be hot property in the American professional ranks and the Louisville sponsoring group paid $100,000 to sign him up to a professional contract. Now of course that pales into insignificance when you consider how much money boxers get paid now but in the early 1960s, $100,000 was an awful amount of money and Ali and his family must have believed he was made, but Ali was always somebody of generous spirit and the first thing he did when he got his money was go out and buy his mother Odessa a pink Cadillac. He gets his paycheck, the first thing he does, what does he do, does he buy a house, does he invest it? He buys a pink Cadillac and gives it to his mum. I think his managers would have been probably pulling their hair out at that, but that was Mohammed. He was his own man and he followed his own, his own path and it was a pink Cadillac that he wanted, that's what he got. He went with 10 businessmen, 10 local millionaires. They threw the money in the kitty and then they started to promote him. They got him started. That gave him the stability and what that really did is that allowed him to pay off the heavy mortgage on the family home that his father had. So he, he was keen to, to share the money around, but with that money and with his status as a professional, many people believe that Ali had really arrived as a boxer. Cassius Clay of Chicago challenges Gary Joyce, the Eastern heavyweight champ, and Joyce is in trouble from the first round on. After signing his first professional contract, Ali managed to persuade legendary trainer Angelo Dundee to become his coach. And it was a partnership that was about to change the boxing world. Well, Angelo Dundee first came across a very young Cassius Clay in the late 1950s when Ali was building up his amateur career. And Ali was determined to have great boxing figures surrounding him when he became a professional. He picks out Angelo Dundee, who was one of the most high esteemed trainers of the moment. He picks him as his trainer. Dundee had, had brought through some great fighters and, and got good results, so he, he, he had faith in him. Well, Ali went to a hotel lobby in Louisville when Dundee was upstairs with his world light -like heavyweight champion, Willie Pastrana, and he picked the phone up and he said, now, Mr. Mr. Dundee, my name's Cassius Marcellus Clay and I'm gonna win the Golden Gloves, I'm gonna win the Olympics, I'm gonna win the world heavyweight title. And he went for Angelo Dundee as his trainer and Sugar Ray Robinson, who was a legendary American fighter, as his manager. Well, Robinson turned him down, but Angelo Dundee did agree to speak to him when he signed as a professional, but he thought he was mad. He'd seen all of the, uh, the work that Ali did outside of the ring, and he wasn't too sure he wanted to become involved, but, but once he met Ali, he really saw the fire and the desire in his eyes to become the greatest, which, of course, he eventually did. 
with Ali's natural ability and Angelo Dundee's confidence and instilling confidence and instilling his work ethic into Ali made obviously made Ali the better fighter. Angelo Dundee was almost persuaded to become Ali's trainer and I think without him, Ali wouldn't have been the boxer he became. Muhammad Ali is world famous for his trash talking toward opponents. But where did this controversial persona originate from? After a fight in Vegas, Ali met Gorgeous George, who was a professional wrestler at the time. And he, he's a footnote in Ali's career, but he's a very significant one because he was a brash, larger-than-life figure who indulged in the trash talking both before his bouts and, and during them as well. And Ali saw this and, and it clearly resonated with him because basically he, he then produced a persona which was very similar to Gorgeous George, which he took on throughout his boxing career. Cassius Marcellus Clay, age 24, in his own view, the greatest and the prettiest, but as others see him, the loudest and the brashest. Round five. This will be no contest. This will be a total annihilation. Ali had always been a good talker, but in 1961, he had a fight with a guy called Duke Sabre Dog in Las Vegas. And a few days before the fight, he manages to get himself on the radio. And he's sitting down in his radio studio. And in comes this guy with blonde hair, making loads of noise, and sits down. The radio interviewer says, you know, this Saturday at the Dunes or wherever, you know, this young, young Cassius Clay, Olympic gold medalist from last year, is going to be fighting Duke Sabadong. What have you got to say about it? And Ali then says, you know, it's going to be a good fight. You know, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to do what I've got to do. And I hope I win. And I hope the fans come out. I hope they like it, you know, because, you know, I think I'm going to be a great champion. Suddenly, the radio announcer says, and George, and you're fighting at the convention center the next night. What's going to happen to you? Well, I'm going to tear his head off. I'm going to rip his head off. I'm going to send it back to his mother in a box. Then I'm going to stamp on him. Then I'm going to take his clothes. And then oh, it's somebody, and Ali is looking, or Clay is looking at this guy thinking, whoa. So he leaves there and he has like an epiphany. He thinks, listen, I'm a bad talker. And from then on, that's when he switches. No special training. Just be at the fight. I'm ready to back up everything I'm saying. At the time, boxing was was relatively straight outside the ring. The boxers would basically have their way in, look at each other, walk away. There were, there were no quotes, there were no sound bites, there was certainly no, no circus before fights. So you be ready for, you hear? Be ready, because I'm coming to get you. Then Ali arrived, he was talking about floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee, he was going out to really insult his opponent. And after I'm through beating him, I think you'll have to join the Beatles and be a singer. Nobody had done this before. Ali was the first. And of course, as we see now, virtually every single other boxer in the professional rank indulges in the trash talking, indulges in the showmanship. And that's because of Muhammad Ali and what he saw in Gorgeous George. He's dying to get in the ring with me again. Well, he'll get his chance. In 1963, Ali traveled to London, England to fight his first professional bout abroad and took on the UK's hard-hitting Henry Cooper. Well, it was a big deal for Ali to fight outside of America, and he came to one of the most iconic venues in London, Wembley Stadium, and there were 55,000 people there to see Ali fight Henry Cooper. The Cooper was what a heavyweight really was accepted to be at that time. He was a big puncher, he was a strong man, he was aggressive, a gentle giant, but in the ring, a brutal man too. When Ali was a slight betting underdog, Cooper was seasoned, you know, he'd been there, he'd done that. Right at the end of the fourth round, he caught Ali with his famous Henry's hammer, the left hook, and Ali went down. Great left hook. Fantastic punch, obviously. It was his honey punch. As he's on the floor, gone, but he's got a great sense of recovery. He wakes up as he hits the floor, hits the ropes, he gets up, bell goes, comes back to the corner. And he's up at about three, Clay. That was the end of the fourth round, and he hit him about two seconds before the end of the round. Now, Angelo Dundee had noticed a tiny little tear in one of the gloves, okay? So what he did is he manipulated the tear a little bit more, called over the referee and gained a bit of extra time. And significantly, the end of that round was far longer than it should have been. So Ali was able to recover and Cooper wasn't able to capitalize. And in the end, Cooper received a cut in the following round and the fight was stopped. Henry's problem wasn't his heart or his power. Henry's problem 
his eyebrows and his cheeks. He was, he was lacerated, cut to bits. He cuts Cooper and uh, goes back to America, still undefeated. Ali, from that moment, had a great deal of respect for Henry Cooper, which endured right to the end of Cooper's life. And he said, when that left hook hit him, it hit him so hard, even his ancestors in Africa felt the punch. After beating Cooper, Ali's professional record stood at 19 wins from 19 fights, which earned him the chance to fight the much-feared heavyweight champion, Sonny Liston. Before the Ali and Liston fight, Ali had been stalking him. His backers in Louisville had paid for him to get on a plane and go to Las Vegas to harass Liston when he was training, to harass Liston before and after his fight with Floyd Patterson in Las Vegas. In fact, Ali invades the ring. He was inside uh, Sonny Liston's tunnel vision. Sonny Liston was the man in American boxing, and, and the build-up was something which nobody had ever really seen before. Ali would drive to Liston's house at 3 a.m. in the morning and sit outside and shout abuse at him to try and rile him. He said in the pre-match press conferences. He was a big, ugly bear, and Ali was going to donate him to the zoo afterwards. And Liston was thinking, who is this guy? He's a young pretender, and he's coming into my ring to tell me how he's going to beat me. Here's the thing. Nobody, nobody thought Ali could do it. I believe inside the Ali camp there was a crisis of confidence. The bookies didn't think he could do it. Nobody thought he could do it, but he kept on singing. I want that bear. And what's going to happen to him? Bear. What's going to happen to him? He might be great, but he'll fall in eight. Ali was a huge underdog going into the fight. And what followed was quite simply the biggest upset in boxing history. The challenger from Louisville, Kentucky, wearing white trunks with red stripes, weighing 210 and one half pounds, the former Olympic light heavyweight champion, Cassius Clay. Well, right from the first bell, Liston charged out at Ali, and it was clear he wanted to rush him and catch him off guard. But Ali was so light on his feet, so nimble, that he made Liston look really awkward. Cassius Clay on the move, as we see, looking to get Sonny to run. It was obviously in the first bell that Liston, the world champion, had miscalculated. He hadn't factored in how fast and how elusive and how good, and I also think how powerfully built and how strong Ali was. At the end of the fourth round, he went back to his corner and he complained that his eyes were burning and Ali said he couldn't carry on. And the reason for that was Liston had applied some ointment to his gloves and it, it had got into Ali's face and had really created problems for his eyesight, which was, of course, beyond the rules, but apparently it's something that Liston used to do. I'm wrong with Clay. I see that, Joe. His eyes, his eyes are bothering him. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't know exactly what happened. They're yelling from Cassius Clay's corner. Something got in his right eye. And he went back out there and the sweat and the, the tears which were flowing at the time washed the ointment away. And Ali managed to work his way back into the fight. And then when it came to the end of the sixth round, Liston sat on his stool and never got up again. They might be stopping it. That might be all, ladies and gentlemen. What slowly unfolded inside that ring at the convention center in Miami was not only one of the biggest shocks in boxing history, but it was a masterclass on how to beat the bully. And then at the end, as he said, I shocked the world. Then he started pointing at different journalists at ringside. He said, I told you I was taking names and I'm taking names. And he wasn't joking. In the early 1960s, Ali became very close with the American Muslim leader and human rights activist, Malcolm X. And it was a friendship that was making headlines across America. Well, Malcolm X was an American Muslim leader and also somebody who fought very hard for human rights. And Ali first met him in 1962 when he was a rising star. He was clearly really affected by what Malcolm X was saying. He attended many of his speeches and rallies over the next few years. He's, he's been in some circles quite widely criticised for his relationship with Malcolm X, but 
I think if you try and put yourself in his shoes, you can see he's a black guy in a country where black people are not getting a fair deal. A lot of the black people, I would imagine, they weren't really in a position to change that. Um, but Malcolm X, he, he, he was. And their relationship was a little bit like father and son in the sense that Malcolm X embraced Clay and Ali and tutored him and talked to him. He was a very charismatic man and most of what he said seemed to appeal to, to Clay. But Ali was having to secretly go to Nation of Islam meetings and mostly with uh, Malcolm X or they were generally just spending time in hotels. And a great deal of what Malcolm X was saying really resonated with Ali and he very quickly became a spiritual mentor for him because Ali saw Malcolm X as somebody who was standing up for black power and black human rights at a time in America when there was segregation and a good deal of racism towards what Ali saw as his people. So the more he listened to Malcolm X, the more he spoke to him, the more that Malcolm X became an influence on him. Clay almost uh, aligns himself with, with Malcolm X. And Malcolm X seemed to become like a spiritual mentor to him and uh, together they, they joined forces. In 1964, Ali announced his official membership with the Nation of Islam. And it was an announcement that was surrounded by controversy. Will your next fight be billed as Cassius Clay or as Muhammad Ali? Muhammad Ali! The conversion had been slow and word had seeped out and the press were against it. Even the black writers were against it. The people around him were against it. Dundee was against it, not on any religious grounds, just because he knew it would cause problems. He wanted his guy to be popular. He didn't want him to be victimized. He didn't want him to, 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 to somehow be sort of put up on this pedestal as some kind of radical, as some kind of bad guy, because he knew his guy was a good guy. It was a tricky time that for, for the nation of Islam. X was kicked out and then X was killed. There were all sorts of complaints against Elijah Muhammad and the way he ran the nation of Islam. The FBI was seriously involved. Muhammad Ali has got an enormous FBI file. He was being monitored left, right and centre. And that was what I think upset Dundee most, in my opinion, was the fact he didn't want his guy to be painted as a bad guy. It was his choice. How he practiced was his choice. And he no longer wanted to take the name Cassius Clay because he said that was a slave name. So he was given the name Muhammad Ali from the Nation of Islam. And he said that was the name which he wished to be now known as. And that was huge news in America because he was now such a massive star. And if you want to look at it, in the cold light of day, it, it, it could have been a risky move as well because it would jeopardize many money-making opportunities and sponsorship deals which he was setting up and could potentially win as his boxing career grew. But that wasn't important to Ali. He felt that uh, by taking a name from the Nation of Islam, he was really doing something important, not for his sporting career, but for his life as a whole, and, and he always stuck to it. In 1965, a year after their first fight, a rematch was agreed between Ali and Liston. The fight proved to be hugely controversial as Sonny Liston fell in the first round to a blow that was labeled as the Phantom Punch. Many fans and journalists started to speculate that Liston had taken a dive. From Louisville, Kentucky, he's wearing white trunks, he weighs 206, the heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. Well, the rematch with Liston was one of the biggest letdowns, not just in American boxing history, but in American sporting history as well, because there'd been so much anticipation after what had happened in the first fight when Ali took the title. But in the end, halfway through the first round, Ali allegedly threw a punch. Many people called it the phantom punch and Liston hit the deck. Ali knocks um, Liston out in the, in the first round with what is called a phantom punch. But here's the thing, if you hit somebody on the chin perfectly, you knock them out. That's why he's called the greatest. And even Ali was surprised that Liston 
had hit the deck. But of course, after 20 seconds, Liston was counted out and Walcott eventually said, hang on, you're out. And that was the end of the fight. And the public were let down. And I think Ali felt let down deep inside because he, he wanted to take on Liston at his best. And there were all sorts of rumours circulating that Liston had huge debts and he bet against himself. And, and that's why he took a dive. And if you look at slow motion replays of the fight, there is a, a chopping right hand from Ali, which does catch Liston. But whether it was strong enough to actually knock him out, we'll never know. In 1967, Ali was drafted into the U.S. Army, but due to his religious views, he refused the draft. It was a decision that was going to have major repercussions on his personal life and boxing career. And shortly after he rejected the call of the Army, his boxing license was revoked and his title was stripped away. Well, by 1967, Ali was reaching the peak as a boxer, but of course the Vietnam War was carrying on at the same time, and in that year, he was drafted to serve in the army, but he refused, saying he wasn't going to fight because of his religious beliefs, and he famously said he had no problem with the Viet Cong, but of course the American authorities weren't going to allow this to happen, and he was still called up to become drafted into the army, but when his name was called, he refused to stand up, and basically, he refused to fight. Pro's heavyweight champion Cassius Clay at a federal court in Houston is found guilty of violating the U.S. selective service laws by refusing to be inducted. He refuses to cross the line in Houston. Within hours, New York had dropped him, taken away his license to fight, even though he was world champion at the time, and the rest of America followed. Before he'd even been charged, before there'd even been a court date, for his trial, which of course he went through and got sentenced to five years, which took a few years to, to, to be suspended completely. Something terrible happened there because possibly, if not definitely, the greatest heavyweight that we ever had, had his greatest years taken away from him. But what it did is it robbed sport of its greatest boxer during his peak period. The years we lost were the best Muhammad Ali years. Ali agrees with that and Dundee, Angelo Dundee told me that personally. The people that were with him in the 60s will tell you. That gap, we lost the greatest sportsman and obviously the greatest boxer of all time. During his exile from boxing, Ali took it upon himself to speak at schools and colleges across the US against the war in Vietnam. He did tours of colleges and universities all around America, lecturing against the Vietnam War and also spreading a word of peace and also emphasizing his religious beliefs. And that took a huge amount of backbone. It would have been very easy for Ali to have said, OK, I'll join the army, I'll do my tour of duty, and I'll come back and I'll carry on boxing. But to him, not fighting, being a man of peace, was more important, and it cost him the peak years of his career. In January of 1970, certain states and boxing commissions began to reconsider allowing Ali to fight again. And just a few months later, his boxing license was reinstated. After three and a half years of exile, Muhammad Ali was back in the ring. Well, of course, in the three and a half years when Ali was in exile, the boxing public, the fans, were really disappointed because Ali was the man. Ali was the hero, and they were denied seeing the greatest fighter in the world strut his stuff. The year of 1970, some athletic commissions were, were rumoured to be considering to give him his licence back, and sure enough, he gets his licence back. And Atlanta were the first state to give Ali his license back so he was able to fight. And in 1970, he fought Jerry Quarry, who had become the man in Ali's absence. It wasn't a walkover. You know, he could have fought a bum. He could have fought a guy that was hopeless. So many champions now, when they come back, they would have fought rubbish, garbage. He went to a top five heavyweight and had a proper good war first time back. You know why? Because he wanted to test himself because he knew if he was going to go on and keep using the same rhetoric and keep pointing and keep claiming he needed to know himself that he still had it in his feet and in his head, and he did. In 1971, Ali took on Joe Frazier, who was so famously given Ali's title when it was stripped away from him in 1967. 
It was one of the most anticipated bouts of all time and was labeled the fight of the century. The first fight between Ali and Frazier became known as the fight of the century, and no wonder. Once again, we had a huge build-up, and Ali was at his trash-talking best, and he was saying that Frazier was a tool of the white establishment, and he was the man fighting for the blacks in the ghetto. And this may shock and amaze you, but I will destroy Joe Frazier. Some people say, you better watch Joe Frazier. He's awful strong. I said, tell him to try band roll-on. That's deodorant. And that really got under Frazier's skin. And as a result, it was a brutal fight. Fight of the century doesn't quite capture it. They sold ringside seats for that fight that are the same price as they sell ringside seats now in Las Vegas. In fights that generate $90 million now, you pay the same for a ringside seat as you were paying then. The fight of the century was correctly named. It was a fight that ebbed and flowed, and it was obvious to anybody watching that the Ali in the ring was still terrific, he was still great, but he just lost that little edge of speed. That had been lost in that three and a half year gap, and Frazier had that little bit extra, but it was still a tight fight. In the 15th and final round, Frazier lands arguably the most famous left hook in history to drop Ali. If you see that in slow motion, you, you just get up and leave because the fight's over. There's no way that man that goes down from that shot that late in a fight is A going to beat the count, and if he does beat the count, he's not going to be able to continue. He beat the count, he continued. He was back on his feet very quickly. Frazier couldn't believe it, but when it came to the decision, Frazier won. Ali lost. For the first time, he'd really lost a marquee fight in America, and it took a long time for the animosity between Ali and Frazier to dissipate. In many ways, it, it never did, but now Ali had a real challenge because he was no longer the greatest, and he had to get back on the pedestal once again. After the first professional defeat of his career, Ali dusted himself down and powered through his next opponents, and went on a winning run that proved he would always get back up after being knocked down. After that fight, Ali is exhausted. His crown has been taken by Joe Frazier. But that wasn't the best Ali. It was a great Ali, but it wasn't the best Ali. But now he wants to prove he's the best Ali. And once again, he goes on a tour fighting people all over. Many of them brilliant fighters. He runs up 10 fights unbeaten. These are hard fights against guys that would even win world titles now, had won world titles in the case of Floyd Patterson, or would be competing really seriously for world titles. Something happened with those guys in the 60s and 70s. And I mean the 60s and 70s, because they had that profile and they had those fights and Ali just wasn't afraid to take good fight, hard fight, Good fight, very hard fight, good fight. He could have just trod water. He could have had 10 fights against 10 nobodies and still got world title fights. He didn't. He went the hard way. He went to the tank or the bank every single time in those fights. In 1974, world famous boxing promoter Don King organized a fight between Ali and the world heavyweight champion George Foreman. The fight took place in Zaire and was labeled the Rumble in the Jungle. This is David Frost welcoming you to the World Heavyweight Championship fight between the champion, George Foreman, and the former champion, now the challenger, Muhammad Ali. In 74, Don King strikes a deal with the, uh, the government in, in Zaire. He arranges a boxing match, a world title, world heavyweight title fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Well, the rumble in the jungle is now steeped in boxing legends. So the stage is set. we just about ready to begin. Round one, the heavyweight championship of the world at stake. And many people believed Ali had no chance because the people who had beaten Ali had been destroyed by Foreman in previous title fights. The Rumble in the Jungle was inevitable. From early 1973, it was inevitable. From when George Foreman destroyed Joe Frazier, it was inevitable. Round one, Ali, and if people thought 
that Ali had no chance against Liston. Against Foreman, they feared for his health. And Ali, very quickly, got everybody behind him. Foreman went into that ring, not just facing Muhammad Ali, but basically facing the whole of Zaire as well. And it was a, an incredible fight. It was extremely brutal. Ali's got a fantastic plan worked out with Angelo Dundee. Ding, ding, throws the plan out the window, sits on the ropes, lets George Foreman, the most feared heavyweight ever, possibly even more ferocious and more dangerous than Sonny Liston, he sits on the rope and lets him hit him. Ali has worked out that he probably hasn't got eight rounds of speed, eight rounds of movement, and eight rounds of power in him to put off Big George. He needs Big George to play his part in his own downfall by ruining himself by just hitting the elbows and hitting the air. That's what he does. So when Ali delivers the finish, just before Storm's hit and the greatest fight in history, the Rumble in the Jungle, as Ali delivers the finish, Foreman would have gone down if a mosquito had bumped into his head. It was the sweetest moment. and Ali had won, and it was astonishing. At the age of 32, he was world champion once again. He had beaten the man who was destroying every other contender in world boxing. Is it the greatest moment in sport? It probably is, if you take into account the build-up. I think, I, I truly believe it is. and it just added to the Ali legend. And in many ways, that was his defining moment. After so famously winning back his title, a rematch was arranged between Ali and Joe Frazier. And it was to be the third fight between the two legends. The fight is regarded as possibly the greatest battle between two heavyweights and will always be known as the Thriller in Manila. Well, I must say that Joe is not cleaning up on Ali here. The sudden late round Ali flurry. 1975 was the Thriller in Manila. We had the third meeting between Ali and Frazier and it was fought in temperatures of over 100 degrees Celsius. It were brutal conditions, and it was a brutal fight as well. But Ali dredged up every single ounce of energy he had in his body, and it was a horrendous fight. Both boxers took an immense amount of punishment. In the early rounds, his boxing skills were sufficient, but Joe is all over in this round. So they go in this ring, the thriller in Manila, and what a fight, they just, hit each other and abuse each other. The savagery is almost unprecedented. And that's saying something for an Ali or a Frazier fight. Right quick lead by Ali. Ali punching better in this round. There's another right, a left and a right. Suddenly Ali seems to have recaptured some punching ability. When it came to the final round, Eddie Futch, the, the legendary trainer for Frazier, threw in the towel and Frazier complained and said, I want to fight. But Futch said, you can't see because both of Frazier's eyes were huge and blown up, and he, he was basically blinded by Ali. 14th round, Eddie Futch, who's in Fraser's corner, says, basically, that's it, Joe. No one will ever forget what you did here today, and that's the end of the fight. Fraser's corner man pulls him out, and uh, Ali <laughs> wins once again uh, one of the greatest bouts that there can have been inside the, the, the boxing ring. After winning possibly the greatest battle ever to be witnessed inside a boxing ring, 
Ali went on to lose his title to Leon Spinks. However, just seven months later, Ali won his title back in a rematch with Spinks, making him boxing's first three-time heavyweight champion. Well, of course, by now, Ali was somebody in his mid to late 30s, which was getting old, even for a world heavyweight boxer. And he, he lost his title to Leon Spinks in 1978. And again, it seemed that Ali had taken his challenger too lightly. Spinks was a young, up and coming heavyweight and just picked Ali off when he wanted to and won that fight. But, but typically of Ali, a few months later, he came back and he beat Spinks and won his title again for an unprecedented third time. Everything post Manila is a bonus in many ways. And, and you know, by then people, not necessarily inside the Ali business, but certainly inside the boxing business were saying that he shouldn't be fighting. So Ali manages to win the title back. They're both really good fights in a bizarre kind of way. But when you look at them in a cold light of day, and I hate to sound like an old man, but the Ali from the late 60s would have barely broke a sweat against Neon Leon in any of those rounds in those two completed fights. Even the Ali from the early 70s, I think would have had maybe a bit too much power, but certainly the 60s Ali, the greatest Ali, he would have made mincemeat of young Neon. But it's significant that between the two fights, Ferdi Paquetto, Ali's doctor, resigned because he'd looked at examinations of Ali's body after the first fight, and he said that he simply wasn't fit enough to carry on, and he said Ali should retire. Typically of Ali, he wanted his world title back, so he fought on, but by now, we were starting to see Ali's body was breaking down. He, he wasn't the infallible figure he was in his youth, but he was determined to fight on. That unquenchable spirit was literally carrying him into the ring and carrying him to the world title. After making history by becoming boxing's first three-time champion, Ali lost his title to Larry Holmes in 1980. He went on to fight top heavyweight contender Trevor Burbick, Ali lost the fight in round 10. And just a day later, he announced his retirement from boxing. Well, the end finally came in the Bahamas against Trevor Burbick. Of course, the end had really come in Las Vegas when he lost to Larry Holmes in a fight that was horrible to watch. Horrible for Larry Holmes. He ended up in Ali's suite at Caesars crying at the feet of his hero. The Burbick fight, well, the less said about that, the better. It was a fight that shouldn't have happened and the people around him should have known better. They knew that shouldn't have happened. Everybody knew that shouldn't have happened. And it's one of the most unedifying spectacles in sport. That left him no option but to retire. He didn't retire at the top, which of course is a great shame. But when he did go out, of course, he still went out as the man who had retained his world title on so many occasions. He was a legend. He should have been nowhere near a boxing ring to take on Larry Holmes and Trevor Burbick, but he was. And then, of course, he suffered for it. After having retired from boxing, Ali's health started to noticeably decline. His speech became extremely slurred, and his movements became slower. And in 1984 came the sad announcement that Muhammad Ali had Parkinson's disease. It was no surprise when Muhammad Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And at the same time, nobody's really guilty of that. He wanted to fight and if the people around him had walked away, one or two did walk away, then he would have just replaced them. The reason why I say it's no surprise is that if you listen to Ali in 60, 64, 66, during his exile when he comes back, before and after the rumble, before and after the thriller leading into Larry Holmes, you've only got to look at his face, you've only got to look at his movement, but more than that, you've got to do the simplest thing. You've just got to listen to his voice. Well, even before he retired, Ali discovered he was having problems with his hand shaking and his speech was beginning to get slower and also become slurred. And in 1984, he was eventually diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and the punishment he had taken towards the end of his career against the likes of Spinks, Holmes and Burbick had really taken their toll and, and life became a real struggle for him. The debate is, did the boxing cause the Parkinson's? Did the boxing make the Parkinson's worse? My understanding is that the medical experts say, yes, it did. Was there anything that could have been done? Well, I suppose he should have retired after the rumble in the jungle. He'd already made 30 odd million quid. There's the last thing that fighters want to be told is that they have to retire. And how can anyone say to him, your health's not what it used to be? He's just beaten 
you know, one of the best heavyweights ever. How can you then go to that guy, what, in his suite, you know, next to the Congo, and say, okay, listen, mum, it was great last night, but listen, we've had a look at your health, you're a bit slow, you should retire. It's like a joke. He was never going to retire. He was always going to fight too long. But the key is, and I really believe this, and too many people are quick to blame the people around him. Those people loved him. Angelo Dundee loved him. Gene Kilroy still loves him. Still loves him. Howard Bingham still loves him. They were there with him because they knew that they loved him and that at least they could take care of him to a degree rather than walking away and having mercenaries come in. Many people believe that Ali was infallible, but of course he wasn't. The legend may have been, and when he got Parkinson's disease, it was a real sad moment, not just for boxing, but for, for many people around the world of any walk of life. Ali is often noted for his courage and fearlessness. And in 1990, he visited Iraq and managed to successfully negotiate the release of 14 US hostages from Saddam Hussein. It was an act of extreme bravery and heroism and speaks volumes about the character of Muhammad Ali. As he grew older, and certainly in retirement, I think he did become a bit more politically active. And he found that he could, because of his position, his status, his name, he could in some ways influence the way things were done. And it's my understanding that he attempted to release several hostages in different crises around that time. Most famously, he succeeded. Jim Brown, the great American footballer, says there are bigger stars now, bigger black stars now, singers and sportsmen and women who just will not do anything that might hinder a sponsorship deal. Ali didn't care about that. He did what he had to do. And I think it's true what Angelo Dundee once told me that Ali always followed his heart. Well, of course, Ali refused to fight in the US Army, but during the, the Gulf War in 1990, he did intervene and helped to rescue 14 American hostages from Iraq. And he personally went there and negotiated their release with Saddam Hussein, which speaks volumes about the courage of the man because he was always looking to do something for other people. And this was a man who'd been stricken by Parkinson's disease. But he went to Iraq, he spoke directly with Saddam Hussein, and then he came home to America with the 14 hostages. So he was a hero all over again, this time outside the boxing ring. And this part of his life often doesn't get the coverage, of course, when you compare it to what he did in the boxing ring. But um, in many ways, it, it, it's more significant because it shows that Ali's beliefs, his backbone, were with him at all times. And even though he was somebody who physically had been broken by disease, his spirit was still there to help other people. In the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia, there was much speculation as to who would be given the honor of lighting the Olympic flame. The honor is generally given to a sporting great of the hosting country. And at the Georgia Olympic Games, the honor was given to the greatest sporting icon of all time. Muhammad Ali. There were loads of rumors about who would be lighting the flame and who would be carrying the flame. And Ali's name never really came up because he wasn't in great nick and he didn't look great. The suggestion being that he wouldn't be asked because it wouldn't look good with him shaking. Well, I tell you what, how wrong was everybody? And I was in the stadium that night and it makes you well up now even thinking about it. Something happened that night. I've been at some great sports events, Olympics and World Cups and great fights over the last 30 odd years. But as he got there and as he lit that thing, as he took it and as he lit it, that's about the top. Well, of course, in 1960, Ali really came to prominence by winning the Olympic gold medal in Rome at the age of 18. And 36 years later, the Olympics were in the deep south, in Atlanta, Ali's homeland. And of course, there was only one man who could light the Olympic flame for those Olympics, and it was Muhammad Ali. And even though he was now struggling hugely with Parkinson's disease, his bravery and his courage were evident at the heart of that opening ceremony when he lit the Olympic flame and the whole stadium was almost in awe because it was Muhammad Ali and he was back on an international stage and it was amazing to see him once again. I mean, it was quite, and when people left there that night, 
people were leaving slightly mesmerized that night by what they'd seen. Energized, but they weren't all, it wasn't gung-ho, it was really strange. I think people realized they'd witnessed something. In 2005, Ali was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom at a ceremony with George W. Bush. It's the highest medal a U.S. civilian can receive, and it was the recognition of all the amazing humanitarian work Ali had done throughout his life. Well, despite the brutality which Ali often dished out in a boxing ring, he was a man of peace. And we saw that in what happened when he went to Iraq to negotiate the release of the American hostages. He also went to Afghanistan for the UN as one of their peace envoys. And that was recognized by George W. Bush in 2005 when he was given this special honor. And I think it was right he was given this because throughout his life, Ali was somebody who had huge ironclad beliefs about peace and about helping other people. You go back to when he first got his professional contract, the first thing he did was buy his mother a pink Cadillac and that just gives you an indication of his generosity of spirit. He likes to do the good thing. Now whether this is on a grand scale, like getting hostages out, out of Iraq and getting them back safely to America, or whether it's on a smaller scale. It's right that the American people always saw him as somebody who was an icon and that's why George Bush was, was giving him this award. Muhammad Ali's annual Celebrity Fight Night has helped to raise millions of dollars for charities all around the world. It's testament to the character of Ali, the fact that he is willing to put his time and effort into raising huge sums of money for the benefit of others, goes a long way to convey the kind and compassionate side of Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali's Celebrity Fight Night has helped raise uh, $45 million. Um, I think that goes a long way to confirming the impact that he's had and he continues to have uh, long after his career's over. And really that sums up Ali as a man because he was often a brutal, brooding figure to many people. He was inside the boxing ring, but when he discovered he had Parkinson's disease, he wasn't somebody who withdrew from public life and became very bitter. He became almost even more determined to do more for other people. And now these celebrity nights and many other charity initiatives around the world generate huge sums of money for the Muhammad Ali Parkinson centers and, and many people have benefited from them and, and really that just sums up Ali as a man because he's used his celebrity, he's used his legendary status to, to, to really help others and, and many sportsmen have, have become legends and have then simply done it all for themselves. Ali has done it for everyone. There is no doubt that Muhammad Ali is the greatest sporting icon of all time. He was involved in some of the greatest battles ever seen inside a boxing ring. Battles that inspired and mesmerized people all around the world. Muhammad Ali is quite simply the greatest. Ali at his peak, and that was in the late 60s, was the greatest sportsman, greatest fighter in history. In the 70s, he was involved in some of the greatest fights in history, greatest sporting events in history. The fight of the century, the rumble in the jungle, and the thriller in Manila. Since then, he's battled bravely against an illness that claims people, and he's just fought against that. But I, I always think about Ali, and I always go back to something that Gene Kilroy told me 20 odd years ago in Las Vegas when he was recalling traveling with Ali and dining with kings and dining with despots and dining with presidents and dining with princesses and shahs. And he said, you know what? He said, there was a point when Ali was the most recognizable man on the planet. And then Gene Paulson said, and he was my friend. And I think that really, that's probably what they'll put somewhere on Ali's tomb. They'll say the most recognizable man in the world and a friend to everybody. And he's a man who's, who's now over 70 years old, but he's still active despite his disease, despite a failing body. He's still looking to help other people. He said he was the greatest. And when you look at boxing, and in many ways, when you look at life, he was the greatest. <laughs>